Hey, what's going on? Howie Spangler here. It's Tales from the Green Room, episode number 128. And today I got my homie, Khalil Wassman from the band Pepper. What's going on, man? Hi, brother. How are you? I'm good, dude. Good. So good to have you on, finally. Right. So we're wrapping up the coast here. I'm all the way on the west coast. You're all the way on the east. Yeah. How's it? What's the temp like over there? Uh, like almost 90 today. And sticky. Yeah. Yeah. That is a... It's, the funny thing is, is this is the first time in 20 years that I've ever been home for a summer. I know. Isn't that incredible? <laughs> it's, it's such a trip, man. I, 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 I seriously, I, I can't remember except for, okay. So I have not stayed in one place and I'm on, I'm on um, uh, the California coast right now. I'm in Oceanside, just, just North of San Diego. I haven't been in one place for this long since the 90s, since I grew up in Kona. And this is like, it's, it's incredible how much I'm enjoying summer here in, in Oceanside. It's, the weather's like about 75 degrees. The, the ocean temperature is 73 degrees right now. And, uh, and there's been waves and I'm, I'm just, I'm just kind of blown away. Like, you know, when you get to that point of acceptance of like, no, no, this is what it really is. And then you just allow it to be as good as it as it is for you. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I guess you never really got got to take the time to uh, appreciate, you know, the summers and, and where you, where you live because you're always all over the country for the last twenty well, years. I mean, uh, you know, I mean, you're very you're very well versed in that. Um, it's like it's like every summer, you know, that is like the it's like uh, the temperature around, especially America around. Uh, around our music, you know, it's a really good combination. So it's, it's a good union of like, uh, you know, the genre of music that we play with this summertime heat attitude. And uh, for the most part, you know, it's, a, it's everyone's favorite season when it comes down to that. Until it becomes like, aug like late August, early September, when you're just done with heat and you start looking forward to like the fall and things mellowing out, and then your sleep quality gets better because it's actually, you know, cool enough for you to get like some deep slumber. Then that whole thing changes over. Yeah, I, I can concur that um, summer summer is our best time of year for the band when it comes to streaming and and touring and things. I mean, touring great all year round is great, but summertime there's just everybody's turns up, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, you know we're obviously missing out on that. This is our you know, we, we had off most of the summer last summer, um, for the first time. And at that point it was 13 years, but th this is the first time, as you said, that we've ever had a summer off since we started touring and, you know, just been in one place for, I mean, we're five months We our, our tour, our tour ended almost six months ago on the first, we, we finished up with Iration in, Got it. and that was our last show of 2020. Mm -hmm. Right. Go. Now, um, now I have been seeing that um, you know you and the the Ballyhoo boys have been putting on like these these special streams. You know, mm -hmm. how how are those been going for you guys? Oh man, they're great. You know, it's it's definitely it's an adjustment. Um, I mean, you guys recently did one, but um, it's an adjustment. You know, because there's no crowd there, so it's just like the the small crew that we work with over at Hartford Sound, um, and they. Uh, they're great. And we actually get to a point where we like, we have to make them kind of clap you know, like when we're done, just to kind of feel something. Um, it feels great to play. It feels great to perform. It just feels like you're having like a, a really highly produced band practice, you know, like, like we're rehearsing for a tour. That's never going to happen in a way. Right, um, right. And it's very strange. Uh, but you know, we still haven't really gotten used to it. It's just, it is what it is, I guess. I'm just happy that we can still bring something to our listeners, you know, um, and they support us very well. It's uh, they, they've taken care of us. It, it keeps us afloat, you know, when buying merch and, and doing through through donations and such. Um, so, you know, it, I feel like we're it's like a, it's a synergy, you know, like we're one hand washes the other. It's like we provide with entertainment and escape. And in turn, 
if they feel so inclined, which they, we never make people donate. We never put up a paywall. There's, you know, they don't have to buy merch, <clears throat> but a lot of times people just do it because you're giving them something and they want to support you because, you know, they, they enjoy you, you know? So that's very nice. It, it really is, man. And um, I'm really grateful for the opportunity to, to just have an, a situation like this. So um, as you mentioned, we did something with the belly up, right? Mm -hmm. And um, for us, you know, if you've ever been in a pepper show before, or you've ever seen us in any capacity, you know that the energy is is very high. It's uh, it's a high energy situation. So, what we did with the belly up was we were able to break it down in a sense of of that old school 1994 Allison Kane MTV unplugged style with candles, flowers. Have like a unity of the Law Records team there. <clears throat> while still navigating like correctly with the mandates and being proactive in the sense of, okay, so how can we better our live streams? How can we bring more value and more entertainment to what we do in the capacity that we can do it in while maintaining like a higher example, a higher degree of, of safety and um, respect? Because no matter what, like, whether you believe in, in, in COVID or not, the thing, the thing that like is the equalizer is our industry is still shut down. So there's a lot of different perspectives, a lot of different opinions out there. Who should wear a mask? Who shouldn't wear a mask? But regardless, our industry is shut down no matter what. It's happening. It's down right now. So if we can provide like a situation, what we just did at the belly up, where we didn't have any energy in the room, we brought the energy down, we gave you the opportunity to tune in with us to try these songs like we're not used to playing them, you know? And to have that conversation, to have that growth, and to have that spin on the show was really, really nice for us, knowing that we could bring down the regular energy of a pepper show to perform something in this capacity, which was authentic and, um, and really, you know, different and fun. And also, you know, building out, building up uh, pop-up tents for, for different green rooms in, in the outside and, and just following all these kind of really cool little mandates that, that helped us. It gave us a lot of confidence for our next go round when we're able to do this again, you know, and I know that we didn't hit it a hundred percent, but, but that was not, the mark I wanted to hit anyway. Of course, that would have been nice, but uh, I just knew, you know, with the ever evolving landscape that we have in COVID, even if I got to like an 83, 84 percentile rate of success, then at least that's an example for all of us to improve on and help our industry, whether you're a promoter, a venue owner, a tech, uh, a, a front of house, uh, a bus driver, anything in that capacity if we can encourage each other to get better at this then we do have an opportunity to bring an experience that is different but hopefully becomes becomes better than where we found it in, in that capacity you know and that's why we really love the camera work we really love the the sound we were able to hire some of our techs some of the belly up techs everyone was everyone was as safe as we possibly could be because we wanted that, you know, we really wanted to, to see what kind of example that we could set so we could have more and more of these, you know, depending on the success of it. And it was a huge success. It was really, really a fun time and a fun show and using the same backing band for um, a lot of, uh, cause it was a peppers and friends show. A lot of the same backing band that learned everyone else's song that is on Law Records really cut the traffic down. So we were able to, you know, get away with less people being there in that capacity. And of course, it was a closed set. Yeah, it uh, it, it looked great. It sounded great. And um, I, I I noticed right up the first thing I thought was Nirvana unplugged. You know, because yeah, of the flowers and stuff, candles. I thought that was so amazing, man. It looked great. Not you guys are by Howie. Not when you're going by that I don't watch an MTV unplug. Dude. They're I, so good, man. They're so good, man. They're so good. <laughs> that that Nirvana unplugged album was like that's forever one of my favorite records. Um agreed. It was so yeah. it was done so well. 
And I love hearing like Dave Grohl tell the story about how how he was he was playing and they kept telling him to be quieter and, and softer and quieter until the point where he's like, do you just want me to go sit and watch the show? Like, <laughs> what do you want me to do? You know, because he's so hard, you know. Um, we really uh, wanted to put Yassad in a black turtleneck for sure, but he oh, wasn't man, and a ponytail would have been great. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, but yeah, I I loved seeing it. I I love seeing um, I love seeing artists go the extra mile. You guys are you know you guys are no stranger to production. Um, you guys have always had really cool production on stage, um, even from you know way back in the day, you know ten years ago when I I think first saw you guys live. Um, or maybe it was the second time. I think the first time I saw you live might have been in in Denver at the uh, at the Fillmore. I want to say it was like you and Pennywise. That makes sense. Yeah, and it was crazy packed. And I think Authority Zero was on the tour. Um, and then we ended up meeting when we were going to discuss the the Law Records deal and everything, or kind of at least kind of get to know each other. Um, you guys came to DC and did nine thirty, and um, you were, it was the Like a Surgeon tour, and you guys had that cool. Uh, the background, you guys, you guys dressed in scrubs and it was just, I, I just always remember that you guys are always like just 200% committed, you know, <laughs> to whatever it is you're doing. The stage last summer looked amazing, you know, like just, it, just all good stuff, you know. Awesome. Well, you know, we, we've been playing music together, luckily, you know, Valley Hill and Pepper for years and years and years. And, uh, yeah, and you are a uh, law records and not alumni. You know, so yeah, and, and, and so to to be able to to find each other at this point of existence and just to be able to talk about how different things were back then than they are now yeah. and how things are the same as well. And this two hundred percent thing that you said, like so I've never had more time in my entire life to be at home with my home studio. And uh, luckily enough, been able to work with Universal Audio and Law Records, and we came up with we came up with this project. Um, I in two thousand nine, Ramey and I started a, a project called the Sabotage Sound System, and we put we put out a record, and it was the whole point of it was for us because let's see, two thousand nine, we had already finished. Pink Crustaceans and Good Vibrations. I think that's the fourth or fifth Pepper release. And those are like produced albums. And so there was like this yearning to make this unproduced record and keep the mistakes, keep the vocals uh, if they were pitchy, but if the vibe was right, release it. And we were able to do this album uh, for Sabotage Sound System called the Boto Machine Gun. Now, 10 years later, I find myself in the studio again, and the my, my studio isn't soundproof. It's not any of that. It's more of like a, a gorilla style approach of recording, but I'm able to kind of do everything here uh, because of universal audio. In fact, local motion, most of, I would probably say like 90% of my vocal tracks on that record were recorded right here in this room. So, so it's been really, really fun to, to be able to build this content in the surplus. And so tomorrow, with, without waiting for a Friday, without dropping a single, without any real buildup, I'm going to release with Law Records and Universal Audio a full 15-song record called Sabo 2. And, all of, yeah, and it's, it's with the premise of this. So... I have so many friends, I have so many different opinions coming at me. Some people have had a very difficult 2020 as far as um, anxiety or, or financial difficulties or hardships, a um, lot of unemployment, lot, all the way across, you know, all the way to my road crew. <laughs> and, and, you know, it's like I can't hire them, so they're unemployed right now. And so I really did want to do this with Law Records and UA to just put out some music that you don't have to worry about as far as a huge release or making sure that you support or any of that. These songs and this album, it's a gift. It's a straight gift. And if there's just one song on that album that allows you to find some ease, 
find like a better flow in your day. Like this is this is the whole reason why I wanted to present it in this capacity. So tomorrow we'll have um you know on Pepper Live and Law of Records and and even you you know Tales from the the Green Room. We'll give everyone the the right links. Make it extremely easy to go. And if you're in the mood to listen to you know some new songs um, without any expectation, uh, I, I'm really really excited to be able to to just allow maybe one of these tracks to like I said just like bring a breath of fresh air maybe just you know allow you not to think about um, you know some hardships or anxiety or fears for just even like a minute and a half so if that if that were just to be the case then it's a total success in my book dude that's great man I, I didn't realize it was gonna be like a, a free gift and coming out yeah, so no, it's, soon. it's, it's so a wonderful. complete gift Dude, that's so great. Yeah, I'll uh, <clears throat> I'll make sure to throw the link in my description for the uh, the video and the, and the audio pod. Um, Thank you for that. And um, yeah. you know, whatever you listen to music on, it'll be available there. So anywhere, if you're through your Pandora, if you're Spotify, but even if you don't have those subscriptions, you know, sometimes the subscriptions, if you don't have them, they kind of block a couple things that you can do. Mm -hmm. um, you will be able to to access the entire album on anywhere that you go listen to it, and if there's any track that you want to download for your own personal library, you can go to my website, Kalea Live, and then um, I'll make sure that you have that link too. All right. That's wonderful, man. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I did get an advanced copy, and uh, thank you for that. <laughs> uh, got it from the Pentagon. They sent me a link, and it was all locked You're away. You're a Records alumni, so it doesn't surprise me that you would get anything. <laughs> Uh, no, I was able to, I was able to kind of jump around a little bit and listen, it sounds great. It's, it sounds, I mean, you say it was done guerrilla style and, and there in that room, you know, it's like, it sounds amazing. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm super pumped on what we can achieve, you know, um, with very little gear, you know, like it's the same here. Like we're all, this is, everything's done here. The last year of value stuff is here essentially. And, um, <clears throat> I can't even uh, you know, uh, when we first started recording 20 years ago, over 20 years ago, Jesus Christ, um, <laughs> <laughs> um, we, uh, you know, just, you know, you're paying for blocks of studio time and it was very expensive and uh -huh. time was elusive and money was elusive. And, uh, you know, now it's like I can come down here at any time of the day, 24 hours a day, if I have an idea and turn it into something and get it out to the world within a couple of days if I wanted to, you know? Um, so yeah, good, good for you, man, on, on cranking this out at home. I mean, what, what better way to, to spend your time, to use your free time, uh, you know, at a, during a time like this, you know, that, you know, it really sucks what's happening right now. It sucks that this is all going down, but you know, if you look at it from the positive and you see the good things that are going to come out of this, you know, um, hopefully, you know, <clears throat> I know I've been doing it and you've obviously been doing it. Um, but hopefully a lot of people out there have been trying to better themselves in some way. And, you know, whether that's, you know, learn a learn a new skill, you know, or, or, uh, you know, go, go hang out with their mom. Like they haven't hung out with their mom in months, you know, or, or whatever, you know, like hopefully doing something to, to fill the time in a positive way and not just kind of sit around, you know? Um, you know, with that being said, man, um, I think it's, I think it's a both and, right? So I think it's really important for people to, yeah, improve and, and, and better always. That's, that's fantastic. Um, and you know, that, that truly is so powerful, but also too, to like really take the time to digest what it is that they're going through versus just, Look, I'm only gonna look at the the silver lining. I'm only gonna I'm only gonna find it this way. I'm only gonna find it that way. That's very powerful, and that has a lot of willpower. But willpower only lasts for a certain amount of time. What you really, what I've really learned in this experience was I I actually was able to have some truth time with me, and really get down to the facts of like, whoa, okay, um, I can't tour. This is how we make our livelihood. This is how our, our road crew and our employees uh, uh, make a living. So instead of just saying, okay, blah, 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 silver lining, silver lining, I was actually surprised 
and with how much work I was able to do with allowing the anxiety and the fear to come up in me. And when I say allow, uh, I really truly mean that. If it came up, I would feel it. I would go through it. I would allow it to burn through. And then at the end of that, after I was able to digest that, it was amazing how, how even more authentic the happiness within me was rising. And it's been a very, very great lesson because as you know on the road, it's like that. It's boom, it's boom, it's boom. You don't really have time to do a check-in with yourself, you know, if you don't carve out that amount of time. This was one of those situations where I had the time to really go in more. And I've really been, um, I've really been more of the positive guy anyway, but I was really happy to be able to digest these, these uncertain, unknown, you know, feelings that were coming up and without having them find a place to burrow within my mind and my body, I was able to allow them to surface and then be able to push them away in that sense after I did the work. And then th that really allowed me to concentrate and to focus on that silver lining because I know that it's really there versus imagining it there. You get me? So yeah, instead yeah. of the silver lining that I'm trying to look for, no, I actually found one. And because I was doing that work in that capacity. Yeah, that's incredible. That's a, that's a great point that you bring up. You know, um, I guess, you know, it, it's not always going to be silver lining, as you say. I mean, I'm sure I've done a lot of processing and reflection as well. Um, but that is a wonderful point, you know, to because people probably are looking for something to make it better or whatever, but maybe now and then you should, you know, let it, let it happen, process what's happening, understand uh -huh. yeah. you know, uh, what, what's going on. And, and, you know, we can, we can learn how to deal with things like this, you know, and uh, <clears throat> wow. Yeah. What a, what a wonderful point, man. Yeah. You've, you've always been, uh, you've, you definitely have always been the positive dude. Um, every time, I mean, since I can remember and every time I've seen you, it's always big, strong, firm, firm long extensive hugs and 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 kisses on the cheek you know and it's just like and you're just always that guy you're just like just just take a second you know and most people are just kind of like in and out you know <laughs> but you're just like you're on there and it's like oh this is this means something right now this is we're connecting you know you know it's, it's exactly it's like exactly how we were raised with our uncles and our aunties and our, in uh in hawaii you know when you were a kid and an uncle or an auntie would grab you, that's it. You're there. Like, you're just locked in. Like, you're in. So, you know, of course, you know, uh, Brett, Yassad, and I being the original three members still to this day, you know, that's that's a pepper show. And, um, you know, when you go and watch the Belly Up show, the acoustic one, you're, you're going to notice that Brett isn't there. And that's because he moved to Spain in March, and then he's locked in Spain, like, you know, there's, there's just no getting him here. <clears throat> and so um, you really like have that appreciation for, for your brothers being from the same small town from a big island in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. And when you do get together, you know, those hugs, those kisses, that's all from our past that lives now. And it, it's it's still like that to this day. And the next time I see you, I am gonna give you what you call it, big, firm, long hug that sticks yeah. around. Forever. I'm doing that for sure. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah man. I mean, it's just, and that's just par for the course. It's just, that's how we that's how we roll, you know. Um, so yeah. I've come to learn, <clears throat> ten plus years of a uh, friendship. Um, yeah, man. So uh, okay, so cool. You got the uh, the sabotage thing coming out. Um, you yeah. guys just that'll did the tomorrow. Actually. Yeah, it's coming out tomorrow. Awesome. Yeah. Um, so again, everybody, I'll make sure I'll have that link for you guys as well. And then you I want to make it so easy. This so easy and whatever platform you want, whether you watch your music on YouTube or Pandora, it should be just super easy. And so all the links, we'll we'll make a fan link, and so it can just go anywhere to everyone, wherever you listen to music. And just 
enjoy it with no expectations. I have no expectations about this. And having our own record label makes these kind of things super fun. You know, uh, of course you, of course you know, and um, are a part of the Law Records uh, collaboration with the Knoll Foundation, yeah. uh, uh, the house that Bradley built, the nonprofit, and um, you know, it's it's such a great opportunity to be able to to make this happen in the pandemic as well. You know, and a lot of a lot of amazing bands on this one, Howie, and uh, it drops on September fourth. So we're really excited about that too. You know, when when you have the Descendants doing Hope, so that line cover, like Yasad Yasad has the best explanation for this. He calls it the Inception, where it's just like where it's like, oh my God, here's Sublime covering the Descendants. Here's the Descendants covering Sublime in that. Oh, so weird. <laughs> That's so cool, though, man. I, I didn't yeah. realize that. I didn't, um, yeah, I was. Uh, yeah, let's talk about this. I I love that. I love that we were that we were asked to do this. Um, I'm a huge Sublime fan. I've always been, uh, you know, very vocal about that over the years. Brad Knoll um, is is one of the my main uh, vocal influences. Um, mm -hmm between him and Brandon Boyd of Incubus. I kind of, I wanted to say the best of both of them and just kind of yeah. make my own thing out of that. And and Brad Knoll uh, was just uh, an incredible artist. His songs are great and they're obviously standing the test of time. Um, and we got to do uh, STP for our, our thing. And um, just, that's a song that I get to sing my ass off, <laughs> you know? Uh, a lot of Sublime songs are like that, as you know, but. That song, I just, I've always loved that song uh, since uh, Robin the Hood back. I think I heard that when I was, I don't know, 18, 17. Mm -hmm. And um, just fell in love with that song. And and I'm so happy to to be a, a part of this 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 compilation album. Um, and as you said, so many great artists. Um, so thank you guys for having us. And thanks to all the uh, the listeners out there that are streaming and and buying it and all that stuff and uh, getting the vinyl and everything because this is all gonna, this is all going to go to to Bradley's house uh, from the Knoll Family yeah. Foundation. Uh, it's Blake really yeah, it's it's really like a beautiful complete sphere because you know we found Sublime we found Brad in our teenage years right mm -hmm. so how incredible is it that this this amazing voice this amazing songwriter musician adapter um was able to show us where we wanted to go with music and then at this point after doing this for 20 years be able to go back to his family and and really expand this nonprofit in the ways that we can in order for addiction and and addicts to have a safe place to go which you know it was really hard for Brad and incredibly hard for Brad's family because, you know, of, of the way that he exited. Um, so it, it really is a, a beautiful, um, just, you, I think you said it, it's a synergistic kind of situation. Um, it's a really all the way around beautiful project that we get to do together. And it's just so ties in the whole way. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, I can't wait to to hear the whole thing when it's done. Uh, again, I didn't I didn't realize that the the descendants were doing that song. It's so cool. Um, and that that comes out on September fourth too. September so that's 4th, only like a couple weeks here. Dude, yeah. So like Labor Day weekend is gonna be like awesome. <laughs> Just tons of great stuff out there for on on people on their boats and shit. Yeah. Um, so are you like the uh, are you like the the now resident host at all the festivals for like Surf Roots TV? Is is that what you do now? <laughs> it's on the well, side. Um, I'm, I, I like I like to do things. <laughs> I really do like to create. I, I love to create. Um, I love to expand. And uh, Surf Roots is just something that I I truly want to see more of because they are giving you know, not only American reggae, but Jamaican reggae, um, a push to get out there even more. So, you know, we've watched this whole um, American reggae genre morph completely. 
I remember when it was just us slightly stupid and barking music in vans playing Lincoln, Nebraska to 50 kids in 2001. And there's nothing uh, about this uh, genre that was alluring. It was like the times of yellow card and that kind of stuff. Uh, Amer all American rejects. Like that was the focus point because it was years after the mid nineties, you know, sublime, no doubt, real big fish push. And we were coming at it from a different angle, stupid and pepper, especially we really were back then a lot more, uh, punky reggae party, you know, mm -hmm. um, instead of, I would say anything else, it was just more of like, um, that vein, that sublime really, really started. Or if you look at it, that vein where, uh, the clash, really, really put it down, you know? And um, yeah, it was incredible to see this over the last 20 years turn into festivals like Cali Roots and One Love and, and uh, so many Arise festivals and, and so many festivals started happening. And then there started to become more and more and more of these like reggae influenced uh, bands in the States. And so now here we have it, that it's, at its highest that I've ever seen it since I moved to the mainland in 1999. So when I, I see a situation like Surf Roots, now it becomes really important to me to even further the reach of the music because a lot of people are vibrating with it in a positive way. This music is really, at the, at the core of it, fun. And you get to do all of the emotional layers. You get to do um, you know, the sad songs, the love songs, whether you're in love or you're not in love with being in love, uh, social, uh, political, all of these things. But at the core of it, at the, at the very dense core of it, there is this element, there is this rhythm of light, of fun, of you can talk about all of these situations. But because of that frequency that is within this genre, especially because it's straight from, you know, Jamaica. That was really the thing that, you know, allows people to step into this world and feel better almost instantly. So when you have like a plat room like surf or a uh, uh, platform like surf roots, I want to start seeing that in bars. I want to start seeing that playing and this and this playing that. I want to see my friends on TV at certain places. I want to see my friends uh, be able to get their music out. I want to be able to see surf roots in Argentina or Japan when we go and tour there. I want it to have that because it brings so much joy to all the people that we rock out for. And I, I want that joy to be uh, available to anyone who wants it internationally around the globe. Yeah. It blows my mind when I go into, you just, you just brought it up, but when you, when I go into a restaurant or a bar, or it's someone's house or, you know, some party or something. And I see sur like Surf Roots TV on the TV or they're mm -hmm. playing, you know, uh, Revolution Radio or a stick figure song or something. It's just like, how do you people know about this? Like, I don't like it's just I just it just feels like, you know, the people that I know around here, people that I went to school with and stuff. When I when I see them on Facebook or one of the you know socials or something go, posting about going to a pepper show or a reb show or something. I'm like, how do you guys know about this? And it just, just shows that how much it's grown in the last, you know, decade plus, um, you know, because for me, I, I look at it. Um, I look at it when it really started popping for me, I'd say it was right around the time that you guys put out no shame. Mm -hmm. um, that is when, because it was like, you guys and stupid were like crisscrossing country, all year long and having these big summer tours and stuff and um that was really where it seemed to uh i remember i remember being in a in towson at a we used to play a place called record theater in towson years ago in 2000s and i think stupid was coming through there and it was like 2004 and like everything you needed just come out and uh i called the the local radio station the alternative station i was like yo can you play whatever by stupid and they're like who's that i don't know you're talking about and like just three years later like you guys are like selling out amphitheaters and you know what i mean it's just it's super weird but but awesome and and then yeah. now now seeing it just it, i wouldn't even say it's exploded it's just been on this upward trend you know slowly but but like 
firm and just like more and more people all the time every year. And I just feel like it's going to last a long time because it's not something what happened with ska, the, the third wave ska was in the late nineties was it just happened so fast. MTV got a hold of it. Radio got a hold of it. And everybody, the consumers, everybody just chewed it up, spit it out. And within two years it was over, you mm -hmm. know, and now it's like, this has just been under the radar. You know, some of the bands like you guys and, um, and even us and, uh, have gotten radio play and, and things like that over the years, but I don't know. There's something about it. There's like, there's community there, yeah. you know, not that there isn't in this, in the sky world, but, um, but like, there's just something there. It's like, it, it, it's always teetered on the side of like jam band stuff, the way you just you build this sort of cult following, mm -hmm. um, you know, and with these festivals and things. And, um, you always see like the hula hoop girl and I, I don't know, it's just, it, it's rad. And then, and then the other thing too, is that, you know, whether it's our show or your show or, a reb show or anything like that you always see people in the crowd and they're always wearing bands of your friends like everybody you know is represented across the the whole crowd you know in, in band t-shirts and hats and such it's just it's an amazing thing that's so it's it's wild how it's so connected you know that's a beautiful point and you're absolutely right like you get to see all of your friends bands on everyone right as far as, as the merch goes and you know, you, you brought up the word community, and that truly what is what this is. It's not only a community for us as being bands, it's a community for the fans and us. So it is a very different genre in the capacity of that's them, that's us. That doesn't exist. It's this. And it's that unity, you know, that we all have together that truly like allow this genre to be as powerful as it is. And because no one just spiked through the roof and that got a whole bunch of attention from, you know, uh, pop MTV kind of thing. I mean, all the bands have had these radio, you know, things come in and go. But the great thing about that is, is none of the bands, you know, took that to the degree of like, okay, we made it, that's it. No, we all know that the way you make it in this industry is consistency. That's really what it is. It's consistency. Not only about the consistency of the music that you put out, because that can always change, but the consistency of like your appreciation. Like, where are you as far as you truly being uh, appreciated for the situation and the shoes that you're in at the moment? That is truly something that is so gorgeous. And a lot of everyone in this genre, whether you're watching or whether you're playing, a lot of us have, and we, we, we hold space for the appreciation of it all, you know? And that, that to me, I haven't seen in any uh, other genre of music in my entire life. Yeah, there's something very special about what's going on. And it just, uh, again, I, I just see it because of, the nature of it and that it's not you know not that there's like mtv really anymore but um even radio it's more it's more about the spotify playlist and things like that yeah um, th there's just there's this organic growth this organic appeal to it that you know it, you know it's kind i'm kind of thankful in a way that that it's not as it was you know let's say 10 years ago 12 years ago you know uh the the old status quo and now it's like the, the playing field has been leveled. It's everything's flat now. You know what I mean? Yeah. You've got to really work hard and stand to, to stand out and, and get attention. Um, but I just feel like that that's how it should be um, for this, this particular genre or community, whatever you want to call it. Um, and it's just I, I, that, that has been the key, you know, as you said, consistency and the willing to play the long game as well. I've seen, I've seen, uh, you know, many bands, friends, you know, people that I'm friends with and things, over the years that that just stopped or, or just did something else or quit music altogether because it just wasn't coming together. And and for me, it's like, uh, I just have, I've always had this attitude. My, my band's 25 years old this year, this summer. So congratulations, um, buddy. Yeah, thanks. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, you know, for me, it's always been just complete drive, full focus. I've lost relationships. You know, I, I don't have, I have, I have friends, I have great friends, you know, but like, I just, I'm so focused on this, you know, and uh, nothing gets in the way. And I feel like if I were to quit now, it would be too soon, you know, even, even after 25 years. 
And, and I just feel like that's what this this thing has. It has it has the staying power. Um, <clears throat> and and because it's not gonna you, it's 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 flourishing, but it's not burning so bright that it's gonna burn out. You know, anytime mm -hmm. soon. Mm -hmm. I completely agree. Um, and in fact, you know, because because we do have that uh, that strength in the genre, um, and not the the concern of it burning out, we're going to be able to showcase more and more people um, with what we're able to do. So what I mean by that is, here you have this whole states reggae thing, right? Mm -hmm. There are so many Jamaican artists that need, in my opinion, to be brought into the forefront of our whole genre, of our whole scene. I want that integration to happen more and more and more. So, which is a reason why I started this project called The Naughty Dawn. And what The Naughty Dawn is, it's, um, I'll just put it this way. It's a, it's a production team, but there's a whole story behind it. And you'll be able to find out. We'll talk more about that later. Um, but the greatest thing about having a production team now is that I'm able to make these musical canvases where we can invite different vocalists to come on and explain their situation, the way that they write, the way that they sing, their melodies, their harmonies, and be able to just give them this, this canvas so they can use their, their vocals as the paint. As, uh, just to bring the picture together. And so I'm really, really excited to work with, you know, all of the Jamaicans that I grew up with, you know, um, talking like all of, the, the, all of the old legendary dance, it, Slightly Stupid does it so well when they have Don Carlos with them, right? And then you can also see it Yellow Man or Barrington Levy. You know, you, you get like these incredible Jamaican musicians that, not only we learn so much from, but where Brad learned so much from as well. And, and, you know, Brad, in this case, he really served really well at being a bridge for us, finding those rhythms and that dance hall, you know, scene and, and all of it. And uh, yeah, to be able to bring that into the next level of this very secure genre here, I'm really excited about that. Also super excited about all the females that are rising up and letting their voices be heard too. This is one of the things where, you know, back when it was like, you know, Stupid and Us and Bargain Music, Chapter 11, and that was it, Dirty Heads. You know, there wasn't really a female presence, and now we have that female presence, you know, going, going. Not only in the States, but in Jamaica. And so to, to be able to, like, unify the uh, the next part of this genre to be more inclusive for everyone. I'm going to be so so excited to see that. And this is how powerful reggae music is. You have your own like Latino reggae. You have deep deep South American. You know, like it goes everywhere. You have uh, Japan, Australia, Russia, China. It's so global. Reggae music is so global because of that core essence, which is it feels good. You know, it's like sometimes you don't know why it feels good. It just does. It's frequency work. And and so with that, I'm going to be really, really excited to see how we can all interact as far as one global reggae community versus like states reggae or Jamaican reggae or South America reggae. And even though, you know, keeping all of your, like your own individuality with the reggae, but also infusing it more and more with others and just, you know, I'm really excited to see where, you know, where, where we will take this, this reggae beat in the future as a global kind of connection. Yeah. There's, there's artists, uh, popping up all the time. Um, and yeah. you know, you, you kind of mentioned this, uh, the, the different flavors that yeah. are out there, you know, you've got, you've got like the, the more kind of punk reggae stuff, like, uh, like tunnel vision is, is one that kind of more punk reggae. And, uh, and we have that, that vibe as well. Um, like straightforward in your face kind of shit with some uh, reggae stuff in there. And uh, then you got like the, the Hawaiian stuff and uh, yeah, like the, right, the, the natural vibrations, you the, know? Yeah. Yeah. The, yeah, the green and, and uh, the the green. Common, common Kings is, is like an incredible live band, um, all great players and, and junior's got a killer voice and just um, the, doing, doing like the writing these really rad reggae pop songs. And um, 
you know, and then the roots and then the, the dub, it's just, it's all there. It's, it's all represented, uh, you know, for, for, I think it's, there's something for everybody. If you're looking for, you know, just a music to, to chill to, you know, or, or even, or even just rip too, man, you know, it's like there's, it's there. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and I love that. <clears throat> um, yeah, it's fun. It's some, it's fun when you go to a, uh, go out to a tour and it's like three or four bands on the bill and it's not all the same stuff. I love when, you know, it's, it's in the same world, but it's all different flavors. So you're not getting the same show, you know, four or five hours a night. Um, the, the people can get get a chance to just kind of, it's like a, I don't know, it's like a sampler, you know, when you go out, if, if you're bringing your friends that have never seen any of this stuff, the chances are they might walk away, you know, buying a t-shirt from one of these bands or bringing on tour with you. Or, um, I don't know. It's just, it's just nice to see this kind of well-rounded, uh, you guys always have uh, cool bands out with you. And, um, I know Reb is really good about bringing out Jamaican artists as well. And uh, mm -hmm. it, it's just, I don't know. It's, it's just a good, it's a good thing to be a part of. It really is. Man. And, um, you know, it doesn't matter like how far away your country is from another country. If you're, if you're exercising the ability to play reggae in any capacity, it just has that familiarity with it. And, you know, I'm going to be really excited when we have, when uh, festivals open up again, when we can go down to Santiago and there'll be like a Chilean reggae act, a Costa Rica, uh, one from uh, Osaka, uh, one from Lisbon, you know, like, like I would, I'm so excited to see it on that scale as well. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's, there's, there's bands that are <clears throat> new bands we haven't even heard of that are, that are just putting in the work right now, rehearsing, uh -huh. writing songs. And then next year we're going to start seeing some pop out. And I, I just love this. Um, so this is Tales from the Green Room. Uh, you got to tell me a little bit about the early days, man. I want to hear yeah. about sleeping on floors and, and things like that. Like, you know, not oh, having enough money for hotels and such. Like, tell no, me about are you it. kidding me? There's no such thing as hotels. Um, you're really lucky if like a venue had a shower, you know, especially as much as we sweated. Uh, I remember in Tahoe, I got one incredible story for you. So here we are, we're in 1999, right? Or 2000, something, something in that area. And we play this place in Lake Tahoe called, no, I'm sorry, it was in Truckee. And it was called Tahoe Taps. And this place, the place green room was, was our van. And it was like, the back door was open and then you had the stage door. So you would walk into the stage or you'd be on stage. And if you'd walk out, you'd be in our band. So very tiny place. We're playing with a band called Bargain Music. This is when Josh, who's a huge influence of, of Pepper's life. And in fact, if you've ever heard the song Stormtrooper, that's Josh Fisher. And uh, he's with the boys. And uh, that's the first time we met Sean Wisner, who is now the TM for the Dirty Heads. And, and he's worked with us for years and years. And Sean Wisner comes up to us and he goes, Hey, you guys want me to run your sound? And we're like, what, what do you mean? And he's like, we just plug in and we just go. And he's like, you, yeah, but you want me to like, you know, tune, tune you in and like EQ you? And we were just blown away at this point. We we're just like, wait, what do you mean? He's like, I can make you sound better if you want me to. He's like giving his services. We we're like, no, we got everything pre-saved. We're good. <laughs> we don't even know what a sound guy is. What are you? Wow. <laughs> and so that, so Sean Wisner was actually our very first sound guy experience. And after that, all of us became so tightly interwoven because we had, we had our band and they, they had a band too, but they had a lot more people. It was packed. So we used our van as our green room, our very first green room per se, which they're going to love this next part. So we get paid, club kicks us out. We get paid like a hundred bucks to do four hours of music. And bargain music goes on their way and we have no place to go. So we meet some friends and the friends say, hey, we're gonna have a party at our house. Here's the address, come meet us. We'll give you guys a place to sleep. I'm like, okay, this is great. Cause it's fucking freezing right now. And I'm like, okay, here we go. We made it, we made it. Awesome. 
So before, this is like before you had Google Maps or any kind of navigation. So we're right there, we're doing it. And we're driving and we're driving through like this trucky suburb looking for this address. And we get lit up big time. And like this is back in the day, Howie, we're like, we couldn't afford to eat, so we drank beer. Like that was really, like, we were we were basically on like the monk diet, you know. The whole reason why beer is invented is so monks can fast and pray. So that was us. So we get lit up, and the cop comes to us, and uh, he goes, "Yeah, boys, uh, where are you guys headed?" We're like, "Officer, we're trying to find this place." And it was written down on a piece of paper. Trying to find this place, and he's like, oh, "Yeah, I know exactly where this is. Uh, do you know why I pulled you over?" And we're like, no. And he's like, the back of your van, the doors are completely open. Oh, shit. And I'm like, oh, man. no way. So we get out and we look. And we packed the equipment in because we were really good. We're like Tetris masters. We packed the equipment in so solid and so tight. Nothing moved. Nothing budged. So he closes up the door. We get a police escort to the party. And everyone at the party thinks, the cops have shown up, the party's done. But it was absolutely the opposite. We set up again and we started playing. And we played at the house, at the house party. Cop approved and everyone there approved. And that was because our band was one of the very first green rooms we've ever had in our lives. Wow, then that's awesome. <laughs> well, remember, remember, stand by your band, man. These bands are so important. Yeah. Yeah, I agree, man. We. We've had like six of them, you know? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we, uh, we, we went through, I think we went through like six vans, six like E350. You know, I think we had a couple of conversion vans back in the day, but um, <clears throat> before we decided to, to upgrade to the Sprinter and convert it to a little mini bus and all that. But <clears throat> yeah, and you know, six vans, five trailers, I think. I mean, just the wear and tear, you know, is, is, is crazy. And um, yeah, sa same thing, you know, we're, playing house parties i remember i was trying to book us a tour and we had a couple days that went away um and uh like a couple dates that just that sometimes shows just disappear when you're on the tour and so i'm, I'm doing i'm calling all we're going through ohio I'm, I'm calling all these numbers like trying to like who do i know do i know anybody i didn't know anybody in ohio it was our first time out and, um, <laughs> you know and like so somehow i don't know what it was somehow somebody got word that i was making all these calls i got a hold of them they got a hold of somebody and then yeah my friend's having a party tonight you guys want to come play i was in, is in columbus and we ended up playing this house party in columbus and that was <clears throat> that was where we kept did, we did a few more after that um at, you know over like a year and a half maybe and that was like our start of how we kind of grew in that part of ohio and, um, and we would just do shows and then we upgraded to clubs and stuff and then bringing people out. But it was just, it's just crazy, man. Like that, that's how you do it. You, you, you make friends, you know, and I'm sure you made a lot of friends at that party that night. Yeah. Yeah. It's and and you know, it was one of those things where later down the line, you see those people showing up to like the, the bigger shows that you're now doing, you know? And uh, it, it really, it really is an amazing opportunity to be able to play everything, right? So imagine if like you're a YouTube star and you just hit, okay? And all of a sudden you go from your living room to stadiums in that capacity, right? There's no work up. Yeah. So being able to do the house parties first, doing restaurants, playing for four hours, getting paid in beer. Pizza places. You know, yeah, yeah. Um, doing like, you know, having like the excitement of opening up for a bigger band. Um, going on your first national tour. Uh, you becoming a headliner. Like doing all these things, it's so cool because now you get to a point 20 years later where if you put us on stage at an amphitheater with 15,000 people, we'll take care of it. But if you put us on a stage, that can hold uh, the capacity of that room is maybe 80. We'll take care of it simply just because we've gone through everything imaginable in that sense. When it comes to all the venues, when it comes to the people, when it comes to the connection like that. 
Yeah, <laughs> there's there's definitely something to be said for putting in the work early and and playing those those small places for for nothing and and um you know getting that experience uh yeah. when you finally take it to the big stage you know you know what it is to be on stage and um and then yeah if you have those moments where you do have to go back and do a smaller place man it's like you're just you're equipped you're ready and and um and oftentimes the shows are even crazier you know because they're, they're smaller and uh people just want to go nuts you know they're closer to you uh, yeah man I love, I love them all you know not there's no show that is like more important per se um for me personally is i just hope the sounds good yeah. like that's like my, num my number one thing because if the show sounds great we're gonna do it and if the show doesn't sound great well what else can we focus on to make this show the best it can be you guys really shine in the in the charisma department like when you're when you're dealing with, you're like some of the funnest dudes to to watch live because it's it is as you said earlier a party you know and that's what it is you guys create a party even like in a big amphitheater you know it's just people the way you talk especially brett brett's really good at talking in the crowd i've always i've told him that many times like oh, bro man. you're like you're like such a good rock star man <laughs> you know? there's, there's, there's so many there's so many pictures of me just cracking up on stage at both Brett and E. Like I look back at those photos and I see how how I'm laughing, and because they 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 fucking kill me, man. They're they're both so freaking funny. Yeah, it's it's awesome, man. <laughs> well, I love hearing about the uh, the old days, man. Um, before we uh, get to the Q and A, hey, if you got questions for uh, Kaleo here, throw them in the in the in the comments. I have a Oh yeah, sure. I'm gonna take a bio break real quick. Okay, let's take a bio break. I'm not sure what a bio break is. So yeah, if you guys got a, if you guys got questions here for for Kaleo, throw them up, and I'll uh, I'll fly them up here in a second. Um, make sure if you're on YouTube right now, please subscribe, smash the like button, baby, so you don't want to go live, put up videos, and then uh, if you're on Facebook, please share the video and give it a like as well. Uh, you can also sub up to Tales from the Green Room at uh, wherever you listen to podcasts, Apple, Spotify, whatever. Um, bio break. Yeah, I guess I guess that would be a bathroom break, right? I'm just I'm all alone. I don't know what to do. You guys ever seen that uh, that scene in Scanners where that dude's head blew up? <laughs> I'm having a good time. Not so. Um, <clears throat> do you remember what Brett called Howie in the summer? Oh, yeah, Don. Uh, so yeah, he called me Thor's dick. So, oh, look at Howie out there looking like Thor's dick <laughs> in the crowd. That was last summer. I had, a, I had a beer in my hand, I was watching you guys play, and I was just like, Yeah, this feels right. Oh my god, I love that. Thank you for that because I don't remember that at all. <laughs> so good, man. <laughs> um, oh, they want to know. Uh, here, let me see. Where is it? Where is it? They want to know what a bio break is. I, I think we know, but a bio break. Basically, when you need to do something alone in the bathroom, that usually involves urine. Or feces. That's a bio break. That's yeah. a bio break. Okay. Well, that's cool. We all learned something. Right, new right, here. I'm a little mysterious here. I'm not going to tell you which one that I just did. Right, that's right. Well, unless, you're, unless you're like a really quick pooper. I mean, we can probably figure out. Well, enough coffee. And yes, anyone can be a quick pooper. Destroyed. <laughs> You'll, yeah, totally. Uh, Travis says, Kona Town was my first listening experience with Pepper. Was Kaleo surprised by the success of that album? Or when recording it, was there a confidence? that it was going to hit love the artwork on it that's a good one travis that's actually really good um travis really you look really familiar travis uh so no um i can't say that there was any confidence in it i can say that we were uh just trying to figure out this recording landscape you have to keep in mind like this was our real first album of course we had giving it prior but that was recorded in a coffee shack back in Kona that we kind of used as a glorified demo. This was our very first record. There were so many things that we had no idea about. 
perfect example, the click track. That was something brand new for us to figure out. Um, the cost of the studio, the timing, all of that, you know, it was like a really under the gun situation. Luckily though, we have been playing those songs since we moved here. Um, so, I mean, we had a few years, uh, uh, a couple years to be able to play all of those songs live. And that was really, really nice for us because we felt really comfortable versus learning a track in the studio, recording it, and then, you know, thinking about what you could have done later, yeah. which has happened um, many times in, in the, uh, the albums after Coketown. Definitely. And the artwork on it, that is an artist that is from Kona. He's a good friend of ours. His name is Ben Bruff. And he does, he does all of, you know, our art in that capacity. There's a couple projects that he didn't work on, which was like the self-titled, which was just the photo. And then Stitches, which was another artist of ours, but everything else is Ben. And um, he's he's the art that I love the most. Uh, yeah, that you guys' art is has that <clears throat> has a classic look to it. Like I know it's yeah. Pepper. You don't want to see he's it. Fantastic. He's just a fantastic human being. And again, you know, it all goes back to a very small town on a big island. Yeah, uh, Stitches is one of my favorites, man. I love that one. It's a good one. Um, Michelle says, Kaleo played over my head for half the night of a couple uh, summers at Go B Riders, where I saw about. Oh, nice. Yeah. Yeah. That's a that's a tight little room there, B Riders. B Riders. Yeah, it's in Bakersfield. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. We'll, we'll I mean, it, it, has, it just goes right back to where we were uh, where we were discussing. Like to be able to do those like really big, like uh five points and Irvine kind of shows. And then in the same tour, be able to do like smaller rooms and and to have like you know those those different elements in you know there's there is excitement about big stages and a lot of people and there's also uh, you know this this very intimate situation when you play the smaller ones that rev you up just as much. Yeah, so, two, thank you for coming, Michelle. Two very different things for sure, but but equally great, you know. <clears throat> um, Zachary says, how has 311 influenced both of your careers? Oh, yeah. Oh, man. Mine greatly. I mean, I remember the first time I heard 311. It was in Kona. It was the Blue Album. And it was it was just so fun, man. I think the first track I ever heard was uh, All Mixed Up. And in fact, I heard that before Down, which was their major single going on at the time, um, only because a really good friend of ours named Jason Kitchens used to blast it out of his Scirocco up uh, in this little like mountain community where we used to all meet up because the cops used to take forever to get there. And he would just open the doors, open the hatch and blast that fucking album. That was, and I have not thought of that until right now since <laughs> it was. That's amazing. Man, that's great. <clears throat> we, we were, Donald and I used to watch the enlarged show detail home videos that they had. They had two of them, and we Cross watched, the side, you die. Cross the yeah. Side, you die. yeah, yeah, yeah. Across the side, you die. Cross the, don't fight the bears. Um, but uh, yeah, you want to guys? You guys want to have a little jam? We're a lot of jam. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, man, it's just like watching them and seeing that, like them play Red Rocks and you know talk yeah. about that and um, and then uh, we we. You know, so that was 96 that we got into 311 and, you know, 12 years later, we're opening up for them. And, and we started that was our the start of our career with 311, like working with them, you know, doing the cruises and, and their tours and things like that. So it's been it's been such a great thing to see. You know, it's I always like to think that that we are proof that you can if you really put your mind to something, you can make it happen. You know, if I say I'm going to play with those guys one day, you know, put yourself on the path to 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 get there. You know, mm -hmm. just stay focused and driven. I, I just love that. Um, let's see. As far as influence, as far as influence, I, I want to answer this correctly for Zach. Okay. Uh, I, I I don't think I know of a more professional, strategic band than Three Eleven. They they have really like shown me on how I want to show up to my shows because they are so calculated, and you know that that is that's confidence in that sense and so you show up confident because you know that um you've been strategic on how to put this on and with the right balance for every band i mean that kind of 
cool responsibility that they bring to their shows is definitely something I, I, I'm influenced by. I love that you brought that up because like the, the, we learn how to tour from those guys. Like we've been on tour, you know, for years, but like we learned how to do it properly, you know, with them, the way they handle their business, the way they handle the production, all these different people as staff members and stuff working for them. And, you know, it's like you say one thing to uh, their production team, like, oh, uh, yeah, so here's the writer, you know, here's our guest list. And within the hour, it's like we, th the writer's here. Oh, everybody got in. OK, you know, all our friends. It's just very sweet uh, setup, you know, uh -huh. very exactly. pro. Um, uh, Canela says, how do you guys identify which songs will go into an album and how many songs do you go, do you have unreleased? Hey, Howie, you have the smartest people watching your podcast. These are great questions. They really are great questions. That's yeah, awesome. these are really good questions, man. Um, okay. How do you identify which song goes on, into an album? Uh, Howie, how about you go first? <clears throat> uh, I, for me, it's, it's, you know, record everything and pick you know if you're doing an album pick the best 10 or 12 that flow the best you know that that kind of sums up the story you're not gonna you know if i could go back to our early records i would drop you know five or six tracks off of those track lists you know knowing what i know now but we mm -hmm. were excited we just want to release things let's put as many songs out as possible and that's that's a great thing to do but nowadays it's like make sure for me i want to see you know because we recorded a couple songs for the girls record that ended up on detonate a couple years later because they just they were too heavy or something you know and the girls is more slick kind of you know reggae with chill and stuff but so that that's how we do it and then if, it's, if there's anything unreleased you know we'll just we made if it's terrible we'll never see the light of day but you know we'll try to throw it out there in some capacity mm -hmm. so um, guys, I, which song goes into an album um i I'm fortunate enough to have a team uh, placed in all of these projects that um, I'm going with. Whether it's a co-write, then that's you know already taken care of because it's usually um, a band or an artist approaching me to co-write with them. So that's super easy. Uh, as far as the album, whether it ends up like on a Sabotage 2 or a Pepper, Local Motion 2, or um, one of these Naughty Dawn tracks that you'll be hearing in the future, I work with people because I find that in a co-creating experience, I am happier with the product. Um, I really, really do love the availability of working with someone that you're in complete alignment with or a team that you're in complete alignment with and you're able to, to all know what you want after the end of this certain project, this, this song. You know, and for me to be able to to have the the chemistry as far as that's concerned, I, I really do appreciate you know making tracks for that. So that's usually what happens. It's it's, it's I I, uh, I rely on the people I create with to allow me to have a better understanding of what goes where. And how many um, songs that you have unreleased? Thousands. Good for you. And I don't know uh, whether they'll be released or not, but. I'll tell you this, my voice memo um, on my uh, on my phone, you know, the, little, the Apple voice memo, I have, I have, yep, yeah, exactly. I was just so much, and we're talking like 3.30 a.m., me trying to like sing a melody that I had in some kind of part of my brain during sleep. And then, you know, like I'll listen to it like, shit, okay, here's another track that we have to go discover. So when I say thousands, I'm really not like exaggerating. It's just, just and they're everywhere too. They're they're just scattered everywhere. Yeah. And they, they are unreleased for for a reason. You know, they're they're not quite ready for that. Uh, let's just say that uh, the temperature isn't ready yet. No, I love that. That's great. Uh, Corey, I love Corey. He says uh, we need to have a run with Pepper Ballyhoo and Spendies one, once the show's back. Yeah, you know, next year is going to be ten years since the last calls tour that the three of us did together amazing already huh yeah 2021 2011 yeah i don't know we should we should talk about that i would love to do that i i'm gonna say this i think that we should play with everyone when we can again yeah <laughs> i think i'm gonna tell i'm gonna say it right now i want to <laughs> play with everybody all, all everyone who's on the road fuck i mean look us up with willie nelson like i want to just go and jam like anywhere like <laughs> 
with yeah, I'm, like, I'm, I'm super excited about that. I'll play with anybody. I'm so Please. stoked on playing live music again because there is something to be said about the vibration underneath the stage with the subs. Yeah. That really like it's like a you know those like a uh, vibrational plates. I yeah. miss that feeling, you know. That really I miss his, his kick or like his little rolling drum uh, pad with all of those 808 hits and the whole thing just goes. Mm. I just miss that feeling, yeah. Mm. Or I watch stick figure, you know, Tom Gown bass, and he has that little uh, that bass pad that he stands on. Yeah. Like, you know what? I'm getting one of those. I'm ordering that from Sweetwater today. I'm just gonna have it just set up in my studio and I'm gonna record with that thing. Hell yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. We like we're I know this is it's super weird for uh for guys that have been out for so long and then now we're just not. It's they just gone, you know. It's so <laughs> put us anywhere. <laughs> That's wonderful. Uh where do you guys look uh, for inspiration? How do you fuel ideas or progress when songwriting isn't coming easily? Rob Donano. Are these plants, did you write these questions yourself? These are good. Yeah, I have a very intelligent listenership yeah. here. Uh, let, let me read this one more time. And if you have an answer, go for it. I mean, for me, dude, every inspiration is everywhere. You know, it's a... Uh, you know, I, I tend to write a lot of love songs. Um, that's just my thing. I don't know. I like writing love songs. And usually, it's like, usually it's like shit, like the guy is super insecure or something. I don't, I don't know. I think there's something deep seated there. And I should probably see, I should probably see someone about this. Um, and I had my heart broken a lot in high school. That's probably where it comes from. Um, so, but yeah, I mean, I just, I just write about love and life and, and where I'm at right now and the feelings that I've had about depression and, uh, you know, just whatever, man. So, um, and for me, when it's not, when it's not coming, it's not coming. You can't force it. Do something else. You know, don't sit there and kill yourself for eight hours, just slaving over the, over the keyboard or whatever, just trying to figure something out. Just go chill. Get, you know, it'll come to you in the form of a voice memo at some point, you know, sometimes you just, ah. yeah, that's how I think. Um, when it doesn't come easily, and, and by the way, I, I'm on I'm on board with uh, with Howie as far as the, the inspiration. It, it, it happens, it, it, and that's a hard, really good question, but a hard one to answer. Um, but I do have the second part of this. If songwriting isn't coming easily, my favorite thing in the world to do is put on my headphones, my little earbuds, and I leave. I leave my house, I go down to the beach, I walk the beach, and I listen to other people. I listen to new music, I listen to old music, I listen to music that's old that I never got into, and I just allow myself to leave my situation and then go listen to other people's stories. And then um, if that, I'm not necessarily doing that to spark anything, but what I am doing that is if I get myself out of a situation that's kind of trapping me, if I can just excuse myself out of it, then it allows me to think of a better approach when I want to come back to it. That's great. You, you know what I've come to realize? I, I do a lot of songwriting in the shower. I think there's something about the ambient noise uh -huh. that does it. Um, yeah, man, I, I do the most of my thinking when I'm either driving sometimes in silence or mm -hmm. while I'm taking a shower. Like it's just something about the road noise and maybe the, 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 the noise of the shower, the sound of the shower. And I'll, I'll have these like, you know, in my mind, like this, that's a fucking hit song, you know, like that, that, that hook is huge. You know, just, where'd I come? I'm just shampooing, you know, <laughs> like, like, what, the, what the fuck is going on right now? So I don't know, man. It, like I said, it's just, it's everywhere. Just be ready for it. Have your phone on you. Um, yeah. you know, and, and yeah, those, like you said, those 3am, grab a guitar, half asleep kind of thing. That's happened many times to me. Say that again. I'm sorry. It doesn't let you go. It shakes you out of bed. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. A great question, Rob. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, that was great. Uh, okay, Travis wants to know, where can I buy some pepper wine? Excellent question. Excellent question. Uh, you, can, uh, you can purchase our wine right now at the Wine Boss dot net so i guess it would be just wine the wine boss dot net or wine boss dot net 
Even better. Howie, let's make sure that they get like a link uh, and, and we'll just, you know, place it somewhere. I'll and um, also, also, we've been doing these uh, pepper wine experiences, which is, uh, you know, either on a day off, on tour, or after a show, we get like a little space, like, you know, a tiny restaurant or a small wine bar, and we set up these, these wine tastings with our pepper wine and an acoustic show. We call it the pepper wine experience, and we really break down the songs, songs that you've heard so many times, but with just the vocal, just an acoustic guitar. And so you kind of hear it like more like at the moment of its conception um, than anything, you know, instead of like the full production on stage. And we've been having so much fun with that. And then when COVID happened, you know, stopped all public performances, we've been able to do these virtually. And our next one is on September 12th. So um, if you want to be a part of that, go look into all the cool shit. Uh, and if you go at, at PepperLive, Instagram.com, I'm, I'm positive that the boys have posted something on it. Uh, yes, I, I guarantee that it just went up yesterday. So yeah, it did. Go, go check it out. And then, um, and then just follow the links to ever and, and you know, you can, you can experience the pepper wine experience, which is a really fun time. We were able to discuss why the story of the wine, why we wanted to um, become partners versus just licensing the name and really working up our award winning wine and, uh, you know, allowing it to be like another, another expansion of it. Dude, that's, that's great, man. Yeah. I, I don't think I've had the wine yet. Oh, well, hey, I always seriously, like, uh, what we could do is on a Tales from the Podcast, we can get your crew, and we could, like, intermingle the pepper wine experience and your podcast at the same time. <laughs> we should totally do that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, I, would, I would love that. Uh, have you guys have you guys been to Sonic Ranch yet? To where? Yeah, at Sonic Ranch out in Texas. Oh, no, not, not yet. But, you know, every single person has just nothing but the best stories. And it seems like they're always out there working with Paul Leary. Yeah, yeah, we did. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but it just, I thought of because of the wine thing. I was, uh, Tony, the dude that runs the place is a huge wine guy. He's like the most um, interesting man in the world, like the real version. Uh -huh. um, yep. And and like, I was getting, we were done the session one night and I was recording the girls album and I was in the kitchen just getting, making a frozen pizza or something. And everybody was retiring, just going to go. Everybody had their own place to sleep in a little hotel room kind of thing. And uh, Tony walks out. He's like, hey, man, what's up? I'm like, oh, hey, what's up, man? How you doing? He's like, you want to drink some wine? You guys want to try, try, try some wine? I got to get some new cases. I was like, yeah, let me call the guys. <laughs> like, dude, for like two, two hours, I called everybody. I'm like, oh, come, come in the room. And like two hours later, we're like wasted, just drinking all this different wine. It was the best. <laughs> so fun. Yeah, wine is a wine's so incredible in the fact of um, you know we really like to have these pepper wine experiences break down the stigma of tasting wine. You know, it's it's really a complex world, and and if we can just soften the situation a little bit instead of you overthinking that you have to come up with some uh, on point description of the wine that you're having, we really like to like bring it down a couple notches and go. Well, how's the wine making you feel? Like, what what song would this wine go really well with right now? Like, and kind of like bring it into to something tangible for for people that don't necessarily have the longest uh, history of going to like a wine college or being a sommelier. And that's you know, it's a perfect. And I'm basically talking to myself because I don't have all of those accolades, but I really do enjoy the process of a drinking wine. B, sharing wine, and C, making wine. And definitely in that order as well. That's great, yeah. <clears throat> that's um, that's a good way to put it. You know, it's not it's not about, just just the way I feel about, you know, releasing music these days, it's not about genre, it's about vibe. It's about how you feel. How does, how does this make you feel? How does this song make you feel? How does this glass of wine make you feel? You know, that's, mm -hmm. and that's what it is, you know? Mm -hmm. Uh, so I'll do one more here. Um, this this actually kind of goes with it. What was the decision to make wine instead of beer, Canela? Uh, to be perfectly honest, I drink way more wine than I drink beer. And 
And with that knowledge, uh, I was able to connect with Thomas Booth. That's a story for another time. But I was able to connect with Thomas Booth, and we were able to communicate in such a clear, focused way that we immediately, immediately knew that we wanted to partner with Thomas. And um, we immediately wanted to get the best wine that we could imagine into a bottle. First of all, just for us, really, in, in, in the beginning rounds, you know, just like, like uh, playing music, right, Howie? Like you just play music in a garage with some other friends that know how to play music, and that's all it is. It's all you want. Same thing with our wine. We just wanted to make some really delicious wine that we could have to drink. And then with that organic growth and uh, the momentum that soon followed, it became really sought after award-winning wine. And, and now it's just turned into this whole nother thing. It's like we've taken it out of the garage into you know the O2 arena. Uh, not quite yet, but soon. I'm, I'm, I'm excited for that. Man, that's so cool. God damn, award-winning fucking wine guys now. Jesus <laughs> Christ. Good for you guys, man. You guys are always you guys are always on the quest, man. You're always looking for the new frontier. And uh, I've always appreciated it, appreciated that about you. Um before we go, I want to remind everybody to check out your uh, your Revel and Muse podcast with your lovely wife. Yes, when are you gonna come on that? I would love to. Let's let's set it up, bro. Okay, that's it. So hey, when we wrap up this this podcast, let's go back into the calendars and sync this in. Yeah, I'm down, man. I, I, I'm so in, you know. And yeah, the Rebel Muse podcast. You can go on it and find it wherever podcasts are listened to. And uh, it's uh, Rebel Muse is a business that I started uh, about five years ago. With my wife Melanie, where we are able to on our podcast talk about you know some some health and balance tools and tricks, but also lead workshops and do retreats and um, you know do do yoga experiences. Um, where, wherever you can find us uh, now, but uh, mostly at Live Lesson Masters currently online. But uh, we have we have so many uh, retreats that are currently postponed that we're really looking forward to uh, hitting up again. Yeah, yeah, I, I encourage everybody to tune in and uh, you know try to try to do something for yourself to get your head right. You know, I think you guys are uh, you're on the right. You're doing something really cool there with that. It's a, yeah, it's a really, it's a really fun time, like, to converse with people, um, even though you don't have, like, a real-time response. These podcasts are incredible when you do get to listen to other people explain where they're at currently in their life, and it does bring this sense of, of union, you know? I listen to a lot of podcasts, man. Like, one of my favorites is uh, Ben Greenfield. He's a, he's like this, uh, he's like this health cat, man. And he does so many interesting things like, like taking a syringe, uh, full of, uh, stem cells and injecting it into his penis just to see what kind of vibrato it will bring to, to his life. And so he's like his own, like little, he's like his own, like little playground of all kind of weird shit. Um, whether whether it's like uh, any kind of you know outdated term of biohacking, but any kind of like improvements that aren't conventional, better said. Any Im improvements that are unconventional, and then we'll see if they improve or not. But he likes that he likes to be able to experiment with these things. So a we don't have to, but if something does open up that he has something to say about it, it like becomes something you're like, okay. Maybe a syringe with stem cells is exactly what uh, what I might want. So it's really an interesting situation with uh, the Ben Greenfield show. And if any of your listeners don't listen to it, check it out for one episode. It's pretty hilarious. Yeah, it sounds like a like a nice little Saturday. <laughs> <laughs> or or um, Tim Ferriss too. Tim Ferriss oh, is is an I'm, incredible podcaster. It's a really good one. I just subbed up for him I, I just uh just found him recently i bought, I bought his book the four hour work week um yes. been, been uh been listening to an audio on on audible <clears throat> very interesting i'm still like you know I, I feel like for me the four hour work week isn't something be, because you know what i do is more i need to be in tune and and 
talking to my fans and, and being available and things like that. I think that's, there's some, there's some value there for sure, but it's definitely geared towards like that nine to five that, that hates their job and wants to get away and do their own thing. For me, I'm already doing what I love. You know, I'm spending all my time on that. So, but uh, I do see value in the book. So I'm definitely working on to, to process all that. Um, mm, Conan O'Brien podcast for me. That's my favorite. Ooh, okay, great. Thank you. I'll listen to that too. He is, he's the best. He's the funniest dude. <laughs> he's so good at improv. He's him and his, his, uh, his co-hosts are like amazing. Like the way they work together, the chemistry, it's so fun. He's just a fun dude, positive, but like, it, it's, it's so great, man. Um, he has okay. some really fun, good guests on there. All right, um, good. That's thank you for that. I can't wait. Yeah, to catch yeah. It. You're definitely welcome. Um, <clears throat> well, dude, uh, Kaleo, thanks so much for coming on the show, man. Really oh, yeah. appreciate I'm it. I'm a big fan of Howie. Ah, man. Yeah. Big fan of Howie. I'm a big fan of Ballyhoo. And um, yeah, man, I appreciate you so much. So thank you for this time for having me. Dude, it means a lot that you came on, man. It's awesome. Uh, please, so everybody, go check out the Rebel and Muse podcast. Uh, we got the Sabotage Sound System thing coming out tomorrow. So look for the yeah. links there. I'll put it in the description here as well. Um, and that'll up. You said also be available on Spotify and Panda everywhere else, right? Yeah. And we'll make sure that you can find the wine and everything that you need. Awesome. Uh, yeah, the wine as well. Um, yeah. And then, oh, the uh, uh, the House of Bradley Bill is, is dropping yeah. uh, September 4th, Labor Day weekend. So make sure you get your pre-order in for that. All the proceeds go over to the, the Bradley's house for the Noel Family Foundation. So it's a wonderful cause. Um, and then uh, go see Ballyhoo and Pepper live sometime in 2021. How about that? Yeah, with the Expendables. With the Expendables. Yeah, yeah, with the Expendables. Last calls too. Yes. <laughs> well my man have a, have a wonderful day uh tell melissa what's up and uh thank you guys for uh for for tuning in this is tales from the green room episode number 128 make sure you sub up on the youtube channel and go you know, pass it around on, on the facebook and sub up at uh apple and, and uh, spotify spotify podcast appreciate it guys thank you so much Take care, everyone. yeah baby <laughs>